Patrick Leahy Cyber Symposium at Norwich University. And we are participating both in person and through live stream and welcome the Senator uh, via live stream to this event. This is about 25 years in the making that uh, we started with this activity. And it really came from the Norwich University Board of Trustees that we created Cyber at Norwich. There were two critical members of the Technology Committee, Carl Guerreri, uh, class of 1963, I think I got that right, Carl, and uh, General Al Gray that told us that this was an area that was important to Norwich University to build and develop. And so with the engagement of Senator Leahy, we've been able to create a national asset in critical infrastructure resilience, workforce development, cyber research, information dominance, and cybersecurity defense education. So thank you for joining me today for this uh, activity. We have an incredible lineup of keynote speakers and panels addressing the latest innovations in cybersecurity and the importance of cyber education and workforce development in Vermont. We will honor Senator Patrick Leahy and reflect back on that relationship that has created this, this set of opportunities in this small school in the middle of Vermont. So, I'd like to introduce Major General Dr. Mark Anarumo. Dr. Anarumo is a directed, uh, de decorated, I'll get that right, sir, sorry, <laughs> is a decorated military veteran, scholar, practitioner in the fields of terrorism, political violence, criminal justice, character development, leadership, and became the 24th president of Norwich University in June 2020, right as our pandemic started, sir. Dr. Anna Rumo's previous position was the director of the, and permanent professor for the Center for Character and Leadership Development at the Air Force Academy in Colorado. Before accepting the Air Force professorship, Colonel Anna Rumo is the vice commander of the 39th Air Base Wing at Insulik Air Base in Turkey. He has lived extensively overseas in Iraq, Afghanistan, Saudi Arabia, Kuwait, Kyrgyzstan, and Korea. Dr. Anarumo serves on the executive committees of the Association of Vermont Independent Colleges and the Association of Military Colleges and Schools of the United States, AMSCUS. Please. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. <laughs> so good morning, everyone, and a very sincere and hearty welcome to Norwich University and United States Senator Patrick Leahy Cyber Symposium being held right here on our beautiful campus in Northfield, Vermont. This day-long discussion on recent innovations in cybersecurity and the importance of cyber education and workforce development in, the, in Vermont is critical to our state and our nation. Norwich University was founded in 1819 by U.S. Army Captain Alden Partridge, who was a fierce advocate for what we now know as experiential education. He believed that our school must produce graduates who are useful to society. And we maintain that belief today. Norwich is also the birthplace of the Reserve Officers Training Corps, ROTC, and home of the citizen soldier. For 203 years, we have been educating young men and women on how to build and defend our republic. Norwich is also known for emphasizing innovation and transformation but we always keep our vision firmly set on the future. We are a pioneer institution, for cybersecurity especially, working with the National Guard, of which we have many representatives in this room. Especially in cybersecurity education, we also develop training and operations policy and manuals for both the U.S. Army and U.S. Air Force. This rich history and our devotion to future relevance is why we are here today and why we host this very critical event. And this symposium, of course, is inspired by Senator Patrick Leahy, our cyber senator. Today is an opportunity to honor him for the lifelong impact he has had upon Norwich University, the state of Vermont, and in educating and training the next generation of cyber warriors, both for the United States and for our allies. The experts that we create through programs advocated by Senator Leahy are needed now more than ever, and this need will only grow. Our increasingly complex world is interconnected by critical but highly vulnerable technological systems. Cybersecurity competency is absolutely necessary to maintain a civil and democratic society. 
it is now commonly understood that cyber dominance is a key component of our national security policy. Beyond national defense and strategic concerns, cyber dominance is also critical for economic vitality and for preserving our treasured way of life. We do live in a free and open society, and this means that our government has limited capabilities in intervening when businesses are attacked or threatened by foreign adversaries. Stated otherwise, when foreign adversaries attack the cyber systems of American businesses, these businesses must be prepared to defend themselves. We also now widely accept that cybersecurity issues are pervasive across all sectors, all organizations, regardless of their alignment and regardless of their size. For these reasons, Norwich University has invested heavily in cybersecurity education, but we are about to take that investment even further. Using our established position as a global leader in cyber education, Norwich will be moving very quickly into emerging areas of growing criticality. We will establish ourselves as leaders in data analytics, machine learning, artificial intelligence, and of course, quantum computing. And through our very long partnership with Senator Leahy, we're establishing a center right here in Northfield, Vermont, dedicated to artificial intelligence and quantum computing. Through these programs and their integration across all of our outstanding academic program office offerings, our graduates will be prepared to enter their chosen fields, not just as experts, but as leaders. In other words, they will be the useful citizens that Norwich is known to produce and that we're expected to graduate. And they will make a difference in their communities, their nation, and our world. So everyone in this room today and everyone joining us virtually, please accept my sincere welcome for this critical day. Thank you. So now let me please introduce some of our very special guests. And this list is, uh, is very, very impressive. And I ask you for that reason to please hold your applause until the very end. First, it is our profound honor to host virtually Senator Patrick Leahy, the cyber senator. Also, representatives from Senator Bernie Sanders' office, James Paradisis, is here with us. Representative Peter Welch, General Gordon Sullivan, Norwich University class in 1959, former chief of staff of the United States Army. United States Air Force Lieutenant General Robert, K. Robert J. Skinner, Director of Defense Information Systems Agency and Commander of the Joint Force Headquarters DOD-IN. Brian McNally, class of 1987, whose father-in-law, Carl Guerreri, is a trustee emeritus and graduate. My very special guest, Joel Charlotte, who is representing Caesar Nader of XCore Solutions and CyberBytes Foundation, emerging partners of Norwich University. Norwich University President Emeritus, Richard Schneider. Eric Goldstein, Executive Assistant Director for Cybersecurity at the Cybersecurity and Infrastructure Security Agency. Commissioner Michael Harrington, Vermont Department of Labor. Annie Redman, Norwich Class of 1983, Deputy Assistant Secretary for Intelligence Policy and Coordination in the Bureau of Intelligence and Research. Representatives from our sister Center of Academic Excellence at Champlain College my dear friend and personal guest, the president of Middlebury College, Lori Patton. The state's CISO, Scott Carby. Matt McCann of the Cybersecurity and Infrastructure Security Agency. The executive officer of the Vermont Guard's 86th Troop Command, Matthew Hefner. Representatives from our sister senior military colleges, Steph Stephanie Travis from Virginia Tech, and David Jones from the, the Virginia Military Institute. Paul Maxwell, the Deputy Director of the Army Cyber Institute, and finally, the Vermont Guard Executive Officer, Christopher Cover. And it is now my distinct honor and pleasure to welcome our next speaker, Commissioner Michael Harrington from the Vermont Department of Labor. 
Michael was appointed by Governor Phil Scott as Deputy Commissioner of Labor in 2017, named Interim Labor Commissioner in 2019, and formally appointed to the role in 2020. Prior to his service to the State of Vermont, Michael served as the Economic and Community Development Director for the Town of Bennington, Vermont. So ladies and gentlemen, please help me welcome Commissioner Harrington. First of all, this is way cooler than an insurance adjusters conference, so <laughs> let's just get that out of the way. Um, I was uh, extremely uh, honored to be asked to fill in uh, for the governor who couldn't be here today. Um, I will not try to do my best impression of Governor Scott, but um, do know that uh, Norwich is a beloved university of his, and uh, as we talk about things like protecting the most vulnerable and growing Vermont's economy and making Vermont affordable and, and making sure that workforce is our top priority, uh, that uh, our institutions like Norwich are at the top of that list in terms of partners uh, that we need to work with and want to work with. Um, I'll also also, I would be remiss being uh, from Bennington if I didn't also acknowledge the fact, and some of you may know this, some who are from out of town would not know this, but uh, the most important state holiday, which is Bennington Battle Day, uh, which is today, um, and represents uh, a battle that was held uh, during the Revolutionary War uh, just outside of Bennington, uh, where um, uh, troops were headed towards a munitions dump in Bennington and, um, and protected uh, by the troops uh, and was considered one of the, the quintessential turning points in the Revolutionary War. So again, um, uh, I'll acknowledge that um, because I think it plays a, a magnificent part in Vermont's history, um, but also I'll put a plug in that it should be a federal holiday, so uh, <laughs> we should add that to the list. Um, Thank you, uh, President Anarumo. Uh, again, I don't know much from the technical side of cybersecurity. Um, what I can tell you, though, is that from a practical side, and I'm going to share just a little bit um, about what we have dealt with at the Department of Labor, because you may be sitting here saying, why is the Commissioner of Labor standing in front of us at a cyber symposium? Um, but uh, as we all know, uh, the pandemic of 2020 took us all by surprise. Um, and uh, what it did at the Department of Labor, as you can imagine, like many departments of labor across the country, is that we went from being being a Department of Labor, um, and within Vermont, our Department of Labor uh, handles unemployment insurance. And so we went from a Department of Labor that served about 16,000 unemployment claimants a year, and in 2020, for about 10 months out of that year, we served 100,000 claimants. Um, and you may say, well, when you're dealing with major systems, you don't really care about the the there's not a big difference between 16,000 and 100,000, but when you're dealing with a COBOL mainframe that has no technology that allows for self-service, right? So our claimants at the time uh, were dealing with this mainframe, about a 20-year-old user interface, um, a four-digit PIN number that got them access into their account. Many of them, by the way, use 1111 or 1234, um, or uh, even more dangerously, the last four of their social security number. Uh, and so uh, leading up to the pandemic, we had um, become aware, obviously, of the challenges um, of our system, the, the limited capabilities it had, and the risk that it posed not only to the state but to the public. Um, and we're starting the process of looking at modernizing our systems, and then the pandemic hit. Uh, and the, the biggest bottleneck in that process was the fact that and this was, by the way, our number one um, uh, prevention tool when it came to fraud mitigation and prevention, and that was if someone wanted to open a claim, they had to call and talk to a human. And so those were our, our number one prevention tools, were interacting one-on-one -on -one with the individual. But you can imagine, as tens of thousands of Vermonters were um, displaced from their workplace, calling our call center, at one point we had over half a million calls into our call center on one phone line, 
uh, on one day. And so we were completely overrun, and, and the first step we took was to take our uh, application that we would fill out of all the questions that someone would need to take to, to be eligible and put it online. And that was the, one of the easiest things, the low-hanging fruit we, we could do. But you can imagine all the downstream implications that came from that. Because what we saw was just a massive spike in fraud. And you've probably seen the headlines that have occurred um, across the country where the pandemic, and especially with regards to unemployment insurance, um, I would say was one of the largest, if not the largest, coordinated fraud attack uh, across, that this country has ever seen, um, resulting in hundreds of billions of dollars going into the hands of criminals. And so uh, when we began to look at the systems that we had to create, because traditionally unemployment was one system, right? There was unemployment. Well, throughout the pandemic, the two years that we took of the federal uh, CARES Act and recovery programs, we ended implementing, I think, about nine systems, different systems in total. In many cases, we were managing those systems using spreadsheets and human bodies and paper. Um, because the technology did not exist, and our number one priority was getting dollars out the door so that Vermonters could pay for food and for rent and take care of their families. And so it definitely highlighted for us the need um, for enhanced cyber protection. Um, because we will eventually have a modern system. So I wanted to talk a little bit about the fact that um, there was limited self-service. We had no fraud team. We dealt with about one to 10 cases of fraud, um, user identity theft and so forth, leading up to the pandemic. Um, we're now in the tens of thousands of fraud cases a year uh, of individuals using stolen identities to access benefits um, using our system. We've recently, um, through the support of the governor and advocating on the governor's uh, behalf, um, secured through the Vermont legislature $30 million to upgrade our unemployment insurance mainframe. Um, but what it has actually caused us to do is think about how do we balance the, the, the space between the human interaction, which is, has been our most valuable fraud protection and mitigation tool, and the need for automation um, and the risks that come with automation. Uh, and so we are looking at the difference between the human and the machine and how do we balance and find the right spot where those two can coexist, preventing user fraud um, and protecting Vermonters. We also are using a national system that now takes our every one of our claims and runs them through what's called the Integrity Data Hub. And so it's a, our um, national association has worked with all um, 54 states and territories to develop a system where all unemployment claims go through and they get scrubbed, look for redundancies and also um, suspicious activity, which has been a godsend for us, but again creates um, the actual hardest part in that whole process is that their system doesn't connect to our 50-year-old mainframe. Uh, so needing to figure out how those two systems talk together has also been another challenge for us. But as we look to the future, I think um, our hopes are high in terms of being able to build a system that provides enough user uh, access so that people can um, self-serve, uh, they can uh, submit claims, they can make adjustments to their claims and their cases. Uh, we can match up the information they're providing and the information their employer is providing in their wage records to make sure that information is true and accurate. And we can also make sure that handshake stays secure so that as people are accessing the system, uh, it that information stays true and accurate to the person. Um, but I will tell you that the hardest part through the whole thing was the fact that, and I don't know, I probably shouldn't ask people to raise their hand, but you can all imagine if I were to ask how many of you have received a letter in the mail sometime in the past 10 years saying, uh, you know, a credit card company, a place where you've done business online, um, saw some type of data breach and your information is at risk, right? We, we've all been there um, and we probably have received multiples of those over the years. And what we found is that in this case of the pandemic is that all of that data that had been stolen over over the past 10, 15 years actually was being sold at a premium on the market. And so there was very little theft of data from 
state systems, but it was all data that was readily available on the black market. And then that data was being used for people to impersonate true and accurate people. And so how do you catch a criminal when they look, talk, and feel just like the person they're impersonating? They have literally all the credentials, right? Social security number, uh, most recent address, current workplace, prior workplace, copies of your driver's license, all of that information was information that was being used. Um, and so, it, unfortunately, our biggest, process, our, our biggest um, step forward and our way to mitigate the fraud coming into our system was to take that application offline. Uh, and actually, at this point, because the number of claims are so small, actually have people uh, submit claims over the phone again. And those, and you'd be surprised how many fraudsters don't actually like to talk to a human being. Um, you know, so again, uh, we have to find that balance because we obviously can't maintain that level of connectedness and handle the high volumes that come uh, with our business. But again, um, going completely uh, electronic and, and automated also creates a whole separate uh, number of risks. So one of the things I'll mention, and then I'm gonna move on briefly is, you know, as you're thinking about today, um, um, again, from the technical side, I probably am not a big help, although I think this, inf this uh, information and, and topic area is extremely uh, cool uh, but, uh, and plan to sit around and listen. But think about the fact that you're, we're talking about major systems and how will they interact with the people that use them? How will they protect the public that is engaging with them? Um, because that is where typically the breakdown occurs. When we look at cybersecurity across Vermont, I just want to highlight the fact that um, I think Vermont is um, primed to be a, a key leader in the area of cybersecurity. Um, but I also think it provides value to our residents and our businesses because um, being an extremely small state, an extremely rural state, we also struggle with our residents and businesses understanding intuitively how to use technology to their benefit. Uh, and so uh, we need to be thinking also about how do we inform the public and inform businesses on how to protect their most valuable assets uh, and their money. Uh, and so, uh, again, um, as we're thinking about cybersecurity across Vermont, uh, I think there's a great opportunity for us to partner with Norwich um, as a state and, and be leaders in that area. But we also need to be thinking about the constituents and how they interact and what cybersecurity means to them. When we look across workforce, uh, we, I know um, we think a lot about training and development and um, working with the organizations like Norwich and the other universities or our career and technical education centers. Um, but at the same time, we have to think about are we creating the environment where we can build a workforce? And so when we look at across Vermont, we, like every other state, are struggling to find workers. Uh, all of you, I'm sure, drive down the road and see the, sign, the help wanted signs or find that your um, favorite place to eat is operating on um, truncated hours uh, or you can't access the business that you're used to accessing because they don't have the staff to keep their doors open. And so this is a challenge we see across the country. Um, we, we won't be able to solve that problem with simply the people living in our state. We'll also need to look to grow our state. Uh, and so one of the key initiatives uh, that the governor and his team are putting forward is the idea of net new workers, right? So how do we grow the workforce um, the way we need it to work for us as a state, for our businesses, um, for our residents? Uh, and that will come both from within through training uh, and development and making sure that people who graduate from our uh, our high schools, our technical centers, our colleges and universities um, can go directly into work uh, within our state, um, but also how do we grow that from outside? And to do that, we need to invest in areas outside of education um, in terms of training and development. Uh, and that's why you saw um, the governor and the legislature take um, critical steps uh, during the uh, Recovery Act process to make sure we were making key investments in things like affordable and quality housing. Uh, and making sure we were creating top tier educational institutions and, and schools for our students and making sure that we're investing in infrastructure so that our 
neighborhoods are safe and can manage the growth of individuals and businesses. Because I'll tell you right now, and I don't know uh, how many of you run into this, but our biggest challenge in recruiting, even at the Department of Labor, is finding housing for those people that want to come work for us. And so we need to make critical investments in infrastructure in order to be able to grow our economy and grow our workforce. We look at a number of different things, though, in, uh, in terms of growing our, our workforce from within, which I mentioned, things like work-based learning, on-the-job training, career pathways, credentialing, um, the registered apprenticeship programs that we have. Uh, so again, as we're thinking about the future of Norwich, the future of Vermont, um, we are looking at different ways to educate so that we can move our students coming out of these various institutions directly into meaningful jobs. Our number one asset is our youth, and we want to make sure that as they graduate um, from whatever program, institution, or credential, um, that they can move directly into employment and stay right here in Vermont. Uh, finally, I just want to touch on um, the fact that it's a, an incredible honor to be here at the Leahy uh, Symposium. Um, uh, the senator and his family uh, have uh, are near and dear to me and have a special place in my heart for uh, a couple different reasons, but I want to talk what that means at the national level. So even as recently as um, the past month, President Biden and the U.S. Department of Labor issued a 120-day challenge to states and companies to promote and develop registered apprenticeships in cybersecurity. Here in Vermont, uh, the Department of Labor and the governor recognize the importance of that um, and how that impacts, as the president said, across all sectors. Uh, so not just those that are uh, dedicated in cybersecurity, but cybersecurity plays a role across all sectors and businesses for our citizens uh, and for our democratic election system as well. Uh, we at the department and the administration have accepted that challenge and have started working with private sector companies, the Agency of Commerce and Community Development, and best in the nation cybersecurity programs to develop those right here in our own backyard and to make sure that Vermont is a leader in the cybersecurity workforce. Again, as I mentioned, we have a number of different businesses that have taken up the opportunity to create internships and registered apprenticeships here in Vermont, uh, and we'll be working with them to make sure that they have the, the cybersecurity registered apprenticeship programs at their fingertips um, so that we can uh, meet this challenge from the federal government and make sure we're successful in that venture of growing our cybersecurity workforce. On a personal note um, for the senator, uh, my earliest memory of Senator Leahy was the fact that um, at an early age of probably five, I had the opportunity to, to meet my idol, uh, which was uh, Christopher Reeves, Superman. Uh, and, um, and who doesn't, at the age of five, want to meet uh, a superhero? Um, and I have a great photo of my father, who um, was a longtime uh, news reporter in Bennington, Vermont, uh, and uh, a good friend of the senator. Uh, and I have a great photo of uh, Christopher Reeves bending down and shaking my hand as a five-year-old with my father and the senator standing next to us. So uh, I'll always remember the senator as the person who introduced me to Superman. Um, but I I think, I think for all of us here, um, we, can, uh, we can just uh, take a moment and appreciate the impact that the senator has had on our state and each of our lives. I see some of our, our uh, young folks here today um, who will never probably truly understand the impacts that the senator has had on the state in which you live, on your educational opportunities, um, and whatever comes next in your life chances are um, his fingerprint is on it. Uh, and so uh, I'd like to just take a moment and, and give an applause to Senator Leahy um, for all his great work. <clears throat> I'll leave you with one thought, and that is just remember that the best systems, the best processes, the best protocols are only as good as the people who use them. Likewise, you can have well-trained and informed people who are probably going to be your most effective cybersecurity tool. And that's why we're here today. So thank you very much. Thank you, Commissioner Harrington. I, I would point out that it was, as a Rutland County boy, 
It was the successful strategic withdrawal that took place in Hubbardton, completely on Vermont soil, that allowed the setup for the Bennington Battle Day further down. So, so just, it just as a, a little point there. And that would be, you know, we could make a really long weekend being July 7th, you know, possibly. <laughs> so what uh, I'd like to uh, introduce today um, Lieutenant General Robert Skinner from the United States Air Force. Lieutenant General Skinner is the director of the Defense Information Systems Agency and the commander of the Joint Forces Headquarters Department of Defense Information Network at Fort Meade, Maryland. As director of the Defense Information Systems Agency, Lieutenant General Skinner manages a global network and leads nearly 19,000 service members, civilians, and contractors who plan, develop, deliver, and operate in interoperable command and control capabilities to defend enterprise infrastructure in more than 42 countries. Additionally, as commander of the Joint Forces uh, Headquarters, Department of Defense Information Network, DODEN, he is in charge of leading the unified action across DOD to secure, operate, and defend the network. He leads the establishment of DODEN priorities and directs the threat-informed actions through formal planning and future operational initiatives, as well as the command and control of daily unified network operations, cybersecurity actions, and defense operations of DODEN. Thank you. Thanks, Phil. Uh, appreciate the opportunity. And you know, there's there's something always refreshing about running along the river in 60 degree weather um, up in the Northeast, uh, which we which we were able to do today. And, and so, thank you for the opportunity, uh, Commissioner Harrington. Uh, great words. As you were talking, it was kind of a, I'll say, a brother in arms as we're talking about the the 50 year old system uh, with with COBOL because I got an update yesterday from our team on our ordering system for a lot of the services that we provide, um, and that ordering system uh, was actually put in at the start of AutoDIN, uh, which which those who are very mature know when AutoDIN uh, was around, and that's about 50 50 years ago. So we are in the same boat in in a lot of instances, and so. Uh, would love to talk to you afterwards and, uh, and uh, compare notes. Uh, you know, I would say a big shout out to Senator Leahy, right? I, I think if nothing else, Senator Leahy was talking about cybersecurity before cybersecurity was cool. Um, and that says something because that is that, that was at really at the start of truly trying to really understand and define um, the importance of cybersecurity. And I think today more than any, t any time, all the work that he's been able to do, all the work that has actually come out of Vermont and, and out of Norwich is really paying dividends as we think about all the different sectors um, and the cybersecurity uh, efforts that, that are going on e each and every day. The other thing I was thinking about this morning um, as I was talking to, to Dr. Hamilton, um, if nothing else occurs today, um, it will be a success for me because we were able to make a, a connection because we have an intern program um, and we need students. Um, she has students and she needs an intern program. So I think there is a perfect marriage there and so I look forward to, to working with you, uh, to, to Dr. Hamilton, as, as we, we move forward. You know, it, this is the first time I've been to, uh, to Norwich in about a decade. Um, and, and I will tell you, it's, it's been way too long. Um, when I was the 688th uh, Information Operations Wing Commander at the time, now Cyberspace Wing, uh, the 229th, uh, cyberspace Operations Squadron was underneath our, our wing, and so I was able to get up here for a day. And those who've seen me on LinkedIn uh, until about two months ago would, would notice there was a sign of Norwich University and me standing right next to it um, as, the, as the wing commander. I've gotten so much grief over the years because I've gone a little bit past the uh, uh, colonel, and they keep saying, why can't you update your LinkedIn profile? And so about two months ago I did, realizing I probably should have waited about three months um, until after I had this this discussion, but I will tell you it's it, it's an it's a uh, it's an honor to be here today to, to to talk a little bit about things that are going on within the the Department of Defense uh, as well as within the agency and within the Joint Force Secretary Zodin. Now, as uh, the president was, was introducing me, right? If you take nothing else from that, it's that I have two bosses. Uh, those two bosses are driven, and my head is spinning every single day um, as we're trying to both provide as well as secure, operate, and, and defend this thing that we call the Doden. And think about the Doden for, for a second. 300 million internet protocol addresses uh, is what we are responsible for. 
Now, you think, well, is, is, is that a lot? Is that not a lot? That is the third largest in the world. The first one is the United States, which, oh, by the way, I, you know, I say we take credit for the United States being number one because we are a, a big part of that. Number two is China, and number three is the Department of Defense. Each one of those addresses is a potential vector and a potential cybersecurity vulnerability that we have to address each and every day. So that, that, that is a, a, huge, a huge, huge responsibility. In, in, in DISA, we actually drive the secure operating and we drive the, how do we provide support, right? We have the internet access points, which are the 10 key points that, uh, that go out to the rest of the internet that DISA is responsible for operating and, and, and securing. Joint Force Headquarters Doden, which is a component of U.S. Cyber Command, um, falls under U.S. Cyber Command, and DISA falls under the DOD Chief Information Officer. And, and one mission, I would tell you, can't be head of the other because they are both symbiotic of the things that we have to do on a day-to-day -day basis. The Doden is a federated environment. We've broken up the Doden in 45 different areas. We call it a federated re republic, and each one of those federated republics are responsible for their portion. So think of, of the United States. Um, same, same difference. E each one of the states is responsible for a certain portion, but you also have the federal government who is providing support. That's the same thing within this, is each of the different, I'll say, Doden area of operations is responsible for their certain portion, and JFHU Doden is over, overarching to ensure that we have a foundation of success as we look at, at cybersecurity. This includes an infrastructure of 15,000 unclassified and classified networks and cloud environments around the world. The, the Doden terrain includes all enabled devices, such as cell phones, laptops, weapon systems, and the information collected, stored, and disseminated and managed for on-demand access by warfighters, policymakers, and all support personnel. As the DISA director, my role is to ensure the security of our cyber domain so the current and future warfighters can confidently navigate the cyber terrain anywhere, anytime. DISA's customers' mission central functions require reliable and agile IT solutions each and every day. A tall order when you consider that every day we process pet petabytes of data and support, operate, and defend the Doden core enterprise services as mentioned earlier. So how do we do it? The president mentioned we have personnel in 37 distinct locations. We have approximately 19,000 individuals and about a uh, $13 billion budget. We are in 25 states, the District of Columbia, one U.S. territory, and seven countries. Well, this may sound like a lot to some, as we transition defense agencies and combatant commands and others to this thing we call the DOD net, we're gonna be in over 400 different locations at the time of that completion. Throughout our cybersecurity efforts, the highest priority, in my eyes, is command and control. Regardless of location, there is nothing more important than the ability of our senior leaders to securely communicate with warfighters and business partners each and every day. The President and Joe Nakasone have said several times that cyber is a team sport. I couldn't agree more. Unfortunately, our adversaries see these things the same way and are very good at working together, sharing information, and when exploited, can have devastating effects. Teaming up is a critical area of competition, and those of you here today are a key part of that effort. We must do better, and through our focus on transparency, understanding, and collaboration, and I think we will through events like this. The threat and risk landscape are massive and complex, increasing in both size and complexity each and every day. I think that's nothing new to everyone here. Analysts predict a 15% annual increase in cyber crime related cost that by 2025 is projected to be over $10 trillion. As a result, the role of information security analysts and other cyber related career fields have jumped to the top of the in demand jobs list according to online business projections. Industries around the world benefit from the critical work of information security analysts, and because the scope of the threat is growing, and no organization is immune, the demand for cyber, I, cyber and IT professionals continues to grow exponentially. Today, there's an estimated 3.5 million cybersecurity positions open worldwide. In 2010, there were an estimated 9 million unique malware strains on the open web, and in 2020, there were almost 140 million. We're far above that now. If that's not exponential growth, I don't know what is. As cyber threats become more pervasive, our mission to connect 
protect and serve the warfighter has never been more vital. Recently, we've seen major cyber attacks on critical infrastructures. I think everyone remembers the Colonial Pipeline. And while they originally started off as DDoS and just kind of um, trying to prevent access, this is really getting after the heart and minds of our, of our country because it, it uh, affects, the cyber, uh, affects the supply pipeline, um, which affects each and every one of us. And that's how these are, these are continuing to grow from what was a nuisance to now getting after the confidence of our, of our nation. In Russia's war against Ukraine, we're seeing how the fight in cyber is inextricably linked to all conflicts and all levels. We see increase, increases in ransomware, hacktivism, and disinformation in every sector every day. Those malicious cyber actors are carried out by both state and non-state actors. There are dozens and dozens of non-state actors who are participating in the current conflict over in Europe. As long as we have the internet, we will always have cyber threats. Therefore, persistent engagement remains critical across the cyber domain. We must continually work to understand the adversary, degrade their capabilities, and combat their, their attacks. That engagement happens with partners, both internationally and at home. Through continued innovation and combined efforts like the commodification of capabilities, economies of scale, the rise of the Internet of Things, improvements to AI, and moves to the cloud, all of which are here to stay. We can stay ahead of these threats and, com and combat them head on. Adversaries see cyber as a way to increase their power, degrade the power of others, and gain strategic advantage while operating below the level of armed conflict. Money and reputation are absolutely forms of power. We've seen major campaigns from China against Taiwan, Russia aggression against Ukraine, Russian interference in our elections, disinformation, malware, fraud, and outright theft from North Korea, and the list goes on. We've seen adversaries increase the scope, scale, and sophistication of their operations. To combat that, we're calling for bold leadership and innovative solutions. We're asking for active, not passive operations. We're asking for everyone to take cybersecurity to the level above just shielding our systems. Today's leadership will need speed, agility, and the community of effort to stay ahead of the threats and safeguard our economy, critical infrastructure, electoral processes, intellectual property, and personally identifiable information. We need to hunt within our networks, not just put up shields. We need to maneuver our networks to make it harder and more complex for the adversary and the criminals. We can work more closely because cyber is a team effort and U.S. Cyber Command has experienced great success operating against foreign adversaries, especially through partnerships abroad. We've held the largest multinational cyber exercise in the world last year with Cyber Command, cyber Command Cyber Flag 21. Bilateral and multilateral exercises and hunt operations aimed at strengthening our allies across the globe, specifically in Europe and Asia Pacific regions, have also been conducted. During the 2018 and 2020 elections, foreign interference was significantly less than when compared in the 2016 elections. Proof we can combat adversaries effectively in the information space. As you know, we're not alone in our partner pursuit to safeguard the cyber domain. My colleagues at the Cybersecurity and Infrastructure Security Agency, which you'll hear from later today, the Department of Homeland Security and the FBI have had just as great success with partnerships and community of effort at home and abroad. When we come across malware, adversary activities, or new TTPs, we have multiple methods of sharing that information seamlessly across the community, which then gets to each of the states. Something I know many of the leaders and practitioners in this room have been doing for quite some time now. When discussing cybersecurity improvements, Senator Leahy said that it must remain vitally important in every aspect of our lives. I couldn't agree more. Whether you're working as a first responder or in the local government, educating the workforce on cybersecurity must happen for entry level, journeymen, and leaders alike. By staying ahead of the threat streams, through innovative approaches, we allow our institutions to deliver necessary services without interruptions from groups bent on delivering chaos. This to me is where Norwich University, as part of the National Cybersecurity Preparedness Consortium, is a prime player. The focus on educating our first responders and local governments on cybersecurity so they can respond at a moment's notice at any time and any place is a very powerful and critical mission. 
throughout the most technologically advanced organizations I've been a part of, one thing I found to be true is that our strength lies within the people representing the organization, not the technology and not the processes. Like, the, like everyone in this room, you are the ones who make the difference. We must continue to invest in our workforce by building talent through education, experience, mentorship, and development. Being bold and transformative takes commitment from leaders to accept risk and accept discomfort. Too many times I've seen we are too risk averse and we have to change that to be effective. Being bold and transformative takes commitment from leaders to accept risk. Oh, I already said that, sorry. Together we can shape tomorrow's cyber operators and leaders today. At this and JFHQ Doden, we have taken a hard look at the capabilities and solutions we have and we provide, as well as the organizational structure and processes that deliver those solutions to our mission partners. One outcome has been a transformation of our organizational design to streamline our information flow and increase efficiency and effectiveness as we move forward. We have this term we call institutional silliness. You all know it. You've been a part of an organization. It's that policy. It's that guidance. It's that thing that just, that it's out there that is inhibiting our workforce from being the best of themselves. It's inhibiting them. It's, it's inhibiting us to unleash that talent. I would ask each of the senior leaders in here, each of the members here, if you know or you see that organizational silliness, tamp it out. Because that's really where organizational design comes into play. Because we want this workforce today, which I will tell you, this workforce today is much better than when I came in, I won't say how long ago, but it was a very long time ago. Um, I would not have been as successful as I am today with the workforce coming in, in today. And so we've got to make sure that we can unleash this talent. And you unleash that talent through some technology, but it's really about organizational design and, and enabling them. We have major efforts underway to build a zero trust architecture we call Thunderdome, which is a truly transformational way of looking at how we route and secure our data within the Department of Defense Information Networks. We're working on cloud computing, cross-domain solution, and other advancements for edge nodes, to name a few. I appreciate the power of our shared insight through partnership, and I thank you for this opportunity to discuss current trends in the world of cybersecurity. In my eyes, at the end of the day, cybersecurity is not about security. It's about posture, and it's about readiness. How ready are you, and how ready are we? I would offer we have to harmonize three key things to be cyber postured and cyber ready. The first one, as I mentioned, is the organizational design. The second one is the technology. How do we enable the technology? But the third and most important is how do we unleash that talent that we have uh, e each and every day? If we can harmonize those, then we're ready. If not, we are not. And so I look forward to your questions. Thank you. Sir, thank you again for being here, and thank you for those great comments. I have a question about talent management. You talk about unleashing talent, but how is the Department of Defense especially attracting and retaining talent, especially with the cost differential for how we pay that talent? Yes, so, so I would tell you, uh, not great. Um, I, I would say the, the, the department, um, we are still in an in industrial-aged uh, personnel uh, environment. We're, we're transitioning, but we're, we're just not there. Um, the department will never compete against industry when it comes to dollars, right? We just can't, especially as, as we talked. I mean, there's millions and millions of, of, of unfilled, unfilled positions in, in the market. So what we've got to do is we've got to look at, at a variety of factors. The first one, as I mentioned earlier, organizational design. We've got to have an organization that people want to come work for, right? We have to have some incentives, right? Pay, pay can't be dirt, dirt cheap, so, so we have to have some in incentives, whether it's through bonuses, whether it's through retention pay. Um, but the bigger thing to me is the mission, right? We have a mission that most people cannot do. We have missions that people cannot do in industry. They cannot do in academia. Um, and so it, it's, the, it's the lure of that mission 
uh, also. And, and it's also, it's, it's serving others, right? The ability to, to, to serve others um, is also a trait. And so kind of putting all those together is, is what we're trying to do. And as I talked with, with, um, with Dr. Hamilton, right, it, it's how do we develop a, a, a cleaner pipeline from academia to the Department of Defense? And, and I would say this is the most important agency. Um, for, from an internship standpoint, I may be a little biased, but uh, I'm, we're o always looking for, for that talent. So I think bringing all those things together is really what we have to have from a value proposition standpoint. And not have 50-year-old systems that we're, that we're relying on to, uh, for, for the personnel systems. Yes, sir. In an unclass environment, hmm. Yeah, uh, so, so I would tell you, so I spent uh, 16 months in, in, in Indo-PACOM, and I'll tell you that that was one of the best assignments I've ever had. Not just for the snorkeling and the hiking and stuff on, uh, on Oahu and, and throughout the Pacific, um, but it really gives you an appreciation for what China is doing throughout the theater, right? There is a rules-based order today that we are all comfortable with. Uh, may not be perfect, but we are comfortable with they are trying to upend that. And they're trying to up, upend that through nefarious ways. Um, and so the partnerships, to me, is really where it, it comes into play. We have to continue engaging, persistently engaging with our partners each and every day um, to combat what, what, what China is doing. I will tell you, and you're not seeing half of what they are doing uh, in relation to being, I'll say, nefarious um, and, and trying to upset this rules-based order. And so that's why we are, um, while things are happening in Europe, we still can't forget about the, the strategic threat um, that, that, that remains with, with China. And as we saw with the Speaker of the House's uh, trip to, to Taiwan, um, it's, it's, it's a um, very interesting and dynamic environment that we have to keep a, an eye on uh, each and every day, which is why our national defense strategy continues to focus on, uh, on them as the strategic threat. That's about all I can say in an unclass environment. Yes, sir. I will say it, it's a larger role, and and you know. We, we, we could have a discussion on what I call the, the IT bingo words, right? Uh, you can talk about blockchain, you can talk about zero trust, you can talk about AI, you can talk about ML. Um, it, it's almost like an, an, an IT bingo game. But at the end of the day, it's all about how do we continue to ensure that we know what's going on in our systems and our networks, that we know who is operating in, from, and or through the, those networks. And so it's, it's a lot of these different principles that all come together that I would offer is really about zero trust, uh, right? So bl blockchain is a part of that because that, that gives you a true audit capability in, in understanding what is happening within your system. If you talk about identity credentialing and access management, ICAM, right? That gets at the identity of the individuals who are either operating on, in, in or through. You have Comply to Connect, which is focused on limiting uh, the systems and or the people who are able to get on a, a network if, if their hygiene or their cyber posture or cyber readiness isn't up to full speed. And so I think all that actually com comes together. Um, the Department of Defense, I would say, is on a, uh, the initial stages of a long journey when it comes to incorporating those type of technologies as well as, as zero trust. If you talk to Google, for example, they will tell you they've been on a zero trust journey, for example, for 10 years. They're not done. And they say that they're, they're far away from done, from, from being done. And so we as a department, and, and whether it's the state level from a government standpoint, whether it's at the federal level, or whether it's uh, the Department of Defense or uh, other federal agencies, this is a long journey, but it starts today, and it starts with, 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 with what we've done. But I also offer, it starts with every single individual being a cyber um, Jedi, in, in my eyes. Every single individual has to understand the implications of cyber on their mission, 
on their day-to-day lives uh, because if they're not securing their information, if they're not uh, up to speed when it comes to what um, activist, hacktivists, what cyber criminals, what adversaries are trying to do on a daily basis, all the social engineering that, that continues, all the, the, the email uh, fish, phishing campaigns, um, we will never get to it because all it takes is one individual um, and, and or one vulnerability to, to be exploited. And so I think things like blockchain and other t- technologies help limit the effects and or the, uh, the implications of, of those vulnerabilities. Does that answer your question? Okay. I've been on the stage with no questions before, so I'm going to keep it going. Oh, that's fine. I'm doing great on time. Uh, since we're producers of the talent that you need to be successful, are you getting what you need from higher education for a workforce and anticipating the answer is probably no, what can we do better? Yes, um, I would say the number one thing that I want from higher education is critical thinking. This is a complex environment and we need to have individuals who are critical thinkers because what you think you know, usually when you get out and, and, and in an environment, it's not what you actually thought. And so the training that you've, you've had before and the education that you've had before from a technology standpoint probably isn't going to be what, what, what you thought it was. And so if we can have critical thinkers as a core component of every single syllabus, every single program, to me, that's the most important thing. Second thing that I would offer is understanding how to campaign and or to operationally plan things, realizing that when planning meets reality, things are going to change. But if you can't have a, a good understanding strategically of how to plan things, then, then you'll have difficulty in, in this space. Doesn't mean you don't need flexibility, agility, and other things. Third thing I would say is the technology piece, right? So a, a lot of people flip the technology first. I would offer that's, that's the third piece of this because technology is becoming, I'll say, a lot simpler. Um, to, to be able to, to, to leverage. The, the, other, the final piece I would say as we talk about critical thinking, if you have the ability to take the complex and make it simple, that's a home run uh, in, in my eyes. There's still a lot of individuals who don't understand the, the technology and, and who don't understand the, the power of the technology. And for people to be able to kind of bring that down to the, not bring down, bring it to the appropriate level so that others who don't, who haven't been, uh, who haven't, been part uh, of the technology, then that, 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 that's a winner in my eyes. Hey, General, Chris Michener from the University of North Georgia. Um, I would tell you that the university is somewhat struggling with the loss of young men and women into industry, vice service back into the government. And you talked about uh, the, the pipeline process. How, how do you see that going further so that there is an ROI for these um, scholarships and things. Because we suffer with me reaching out to somebody and saying for just our location, NSAG, Army Cyber, hey, I need mentors to students. And it gets into a gray area of I've had people not be able to give them based on credentialing, based on years in, in education, those types of things. So how do you see how, how would you enable us to be able to entice those young men and women back into the federal government side? Yes, uh, so that's a, that's a tough question, right? Um, so so for, for first and foremost, whether, I, whether we can get uh, individuals and students um, on full-time or guard, reserve, I'm all in on all that, right? You know, be, being um, uh, citizens who serve uh, to, to, to me is, is very, very powerful no matter how that is. Um, I will tell you, in, in today's environment, it's going to continue to be hard. But I would offer, we as senior leaders um, need to take the time to help mentor and to take time to be uh, uh, more engaged with our academic institutions as, as, as we go forward. We could, on a day-to-day basis, spend all of our time focused on the mission. Um, but I will tell you, it's the people that are going to enable that mission, and, and we've got to find the time. That's how I would offer is... The, the ability for us to spend more time uh, with individuals like you, with your students, to help highlight and showcase the value proposition of what the 
of what the department and the federal government can, can bring to the fight. Again, as we talked earlier, we're never going to compete from a monetary standpoint, but there may be other things across the board that as a full package um, would be able to better entice them. But a lot of it also is personal experience, right? And us being able to sit down with students, sit down with others, and kind of walk through what our personal experience was. Because um, I would tell you, a lot of individuals in, in academia in the senior leader positions have served in some form or fashion. So I think this combination of those in academia senior leaders who have that experience being able to share that, but also those who are currently on active duty too. So uh, we are accepting questions at Cyber Symposium at Norwich.edu for those in the live stream. Um, I'm Johannes Meyer. Um, I'm a student here at Norwich University. I want to ask how you would think um, open sourcing some more and declassifying more DOD tools might help in the future. For example, the reverse engineering tool Ghidra really helped um, with the community, with the, the cybersecurity community in general, and I believe that maybe open sourcing more tools in the future will also attract more talent. Yes, um, I, I would tell you, I, I'm all in on whatever uh, we can securely understand um, that that will uh, enable our mission and, and bring more, more talent. Um, I know we are doing some things with, with open source, um, and we are, we are leveraging some tools, probably not as much as, as, we, as, we, as we could or should. So I'm all in on, because if that, if that helps bring, bring talent, then we just have to make sure, because of, we have national security systems, there's a approval process that, that still has to be be maintained to ensure the, the, the right, right security level and, and protection levels. Thank you. Oh, yes ma'am. Thank you so much. I'm Lori Patton, president of Middlebury. And um, I know that your remit is more around defense, but one of the things, just to follow up on the last three questions around pipeline and education, that it seems to me we need to do is think about internet integrity and ethics. Um, and basic understanding of what internet citizenship looks like. And I'm wondering if you are thinking about that as part of a defense strategy as well. We, se we seem to understand as we look at our students coming in that they don't have a sense of how to use the internet and how to critique the internet in a way that is all about being good citizens. So I'd love your thoughts about that as well. Yes. So we have, uh, you know, like, there's eth ethical hacking out there. There's ethical AI. Um, I don't, from my standpoint, I've not heard much on the, the ethical citizenship of, of the internet. Um, I think that's something that to look into. The, the question is going to be is who, who follows and who doesn't, right? At, at the end of the day, it, it's those who don't follow um, are the ones that, that we're, we're concerned with, and usually that's part of a, a criminal and or adversary, less, less likely from a uh, I'll say a U.S. based and or a Department of, of Defense base. You know, every single I I individual when they get a, a, a device from, from the government has a use agreement that says, you know, you, you will use this, this system properly. Um, if you're an administrator it, or you have elevated privileges, you have additional training that talks about um, what, what doesn't necessarily say ethical. It says, hey, here's are the do's and don'ts from an administrator standpoint. Um, and so I think there's parts to that but there's not really a, a program of sorts. Wow. Good morning, General. Uh, Henry Collier, I am the Director of Cybersecurity and Computer Technology at the College of Graduate and Continuing Studies. Uh, I am also a cyber warrant in the Army Reserves. Oh, good. So my question is regarding barriers. You mentioned barriers and tamping barriers out. There are a lot of barriers that exist for students graduating from all of the senior military colleges or any university and going into military service as far as the training requirements that they face. And those same barriers exist with the Army Reserve and National Guard soldiers because the requirements for PME are significant. As a warrant, they want me to go to Fort Gordon for four months to learn something that I have been teaching for 13 years. Kind of silly considering I have a PhD in cybersecurity. I'm like the only one in the Army Reserves, right? How do we, as the military and as universities, push through those barriers that we're facing? And we know those barriers a lot of times are coming down from trade off because that's their whole existence. 
how do we get through that? Because so far, I don't see a whole lot of results getting through that. What is your take on that, sir? Persistent engagement. <laughs> that's, that's, that's <laughs> yeah. I've been doing that for a while. I, know, I have the command chief yes. of the Army Reserves on it, but you know. Yeah. I, I'm not certain there there is an easy way with that, right? Uh, and and I said it funny. Um, you know, per, per persistently engaging um, to to really look at things differently, um, and that's what I would say. All of our um, active duty training, um, a lot of our PME, which in some instances we are, but how do we think differently about how to have reciprocity for experience versus a certification or a piece of paper or a, um, and that's what we're, we're really trying to do even within the Air Force, it's just uh, s slow sledding. And, and uh, um, to me, there's, there's not really an easy way, it's just this is, this is hard work, persistently engaging, and really kind of using use cases and examples to kind of show, hey, here's, you know, this is not just equivalent, this is greater than, than equivalent because the principles that you're teaching or want me to go to, I'm actually teaching them. And, and so I think the one-to-one the -one co comparisons is the easiest way to, I'll say is the, probably the most effective way uh, to get after that. Thank you, sir. And having individuals like you who are very open-minded and understand this value at your position, I think is a significant effort in trying to improve this for the future generations through the DOD Cyber Institute. And if you wanna send me an email with, with some specifics, I have a Chief Foreign Officer 5 who I stick all my hard problems with. I, I can have him work it. <laughs> Thank you, sir. Okay. okay, anything else? Oh, yes, sir. Hey, uh, good morning, General. Uh, Brad Everman with Spotlight Labs. Uh, also, just for reference, uh, about 3,000 hours flying F-16 so that we uh, talk about perspective. What I just heard you say that was interesting was uh, talking about for professional military education, bringing in experiences or other things that you do throughout your career uh, that almost smells like a continuum of service where you move into the military through a reserve, a guard, or even active duty, then industry, and then back and forth. So pull that thread for a second. When we look at, uh, you know, the SecAF has said we look at China, because China, China, China is what we talk about these days, or India, anything in Indo, PACOM, or other parts of the world. The way they select their students and the way they educate their students uh, is different from the way we educate them in the United States. So what's your take on our position uh, as far as education goes, the way we educate our, our citizens and our, and our, uh, and our, our uh, military members uh, compared to China and, uh, and India and others. So what's your take on one, our educational process and how we do it and are we strategically positioned where we need to be in relation to them with how we educate and if not, what do we do to fix it? Yeah, uh, good, good, good question. I, I will say I, I'm, I love our education system, um, at least at the higher levels. Um, that, that doesn't mean it, it, it's perfect. Um, and, and I would offer the, the education system that, that I've been watching and seeing um, is actually transforming uh, in, 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 the, in certain spots. Norwich University is, is a perfect example, right? And, and so to me, it's less about the structure of an individual uh, pr curriculum program. It's the individuals together that are learning even more than what's being taught. That's what we have to, to continue. I think that's less, less in, in the Indo-Pacific theater with, with China and, and India and stuff. Um, remember, they're sending a bunch of their students over to the United States to learn better, right? And, and I think it's that, uh, you know, as I offered, you know, the critical thinking piece is, is important, but it's the camaraderie from a student standpoint and it's the learning after hours, it's the learning that's, that's less about the actual, uh, what the teacher is instructing. Now, that doesn't mean that teacher instructing is important, right? Because that is where the, the principles are kind of thrown out there. And then if students have questions, then, then, then they come back. To me, it, it's that flexibility. Um, I, I would offer, we, we have to continue to get better, right? Um, I, I would still offer, you know, we still have, I would pit our education system, especially at the higher levels, against uh, them any time. But that doesn't mean that, that we can rest on, on our laurels, which is why I kind of talked about the critical thinking and, and, and things like that that we really have to get together. I don't know if that quite answered your question, but it's, um, that, that's a hard problem at, at the end of the day. Sir, so if I heard you, so you, th you, you think we do still maintain the advantage when it comes to educating speci specifically on the tech front and, and we're still there. We haven't lost that strategic advantage. I don't think we've lost that, that strategic advantage. 
the, the one thing I think that we have a significant issue with is numbers, right? I, I think from a number standpoint, but I would still take the innovation that the United States does on a day-to-day -day basis over any country. Um, there's, there's ways to catch up, which we've seen that, that other countries are doing by uh, stealing intellectual property and other things, but I would still put our, our innovation above anybody else's. Thank you, sir. Thank you, General Skinner, for your uh, comments today.